kicks off, I'm going to put everyone on mute. I'm going to Margo. I'm going to unmute you and you're ready to go. All right. Oops, I almost left the meeting instead of went to <laughs> share screen. Okay, here we go. I uh, started to put this together. I thought I'll just be a few slides on the Habitat work group. And then I realized, well, no, I think I need a little background. And then I had to live through the whole 20 years. And so you have to live with me. This is not an ocean wave crashing on the beach. This is a Owens dry lake dust storm photographed in 1999. So at that time, the uh, Department of Water and Power <coughs> had been um, resisting controlling this dust or taking responsibility for the dust on uh, Owens Lake, uh, gave up and said, okay, we're going to control the dust on Owens Lake. At that time, it was the leading source of particulate matter 10. Uh, that is matter that's 10 microns or less in diameter and can uh, damage your lungs. Um, the requirement once DWP capitulated was to control the dust within six years. And the project timeline was quite aggressive. So that drove dust control methods. Dust control also produced habitat for birds. So research had been conducted by the uh, Great Basin Air Pollution Control Board on methods that could be used. And they termed these the best available control methods or back them. They were gravel, shallow flood, using water, obviously, and managed vegetation. These were the only three methods that were allowed to be used on the lake to control dust per the uh, state implementation plan prepared by the Great Basin Air Pollution Control Board. So they were driving the bus on what could be done and LADWP had to do it. This is the beginning of uh, the dust control project, shallow flood in the north end of the lake. This is Owens Lake. This is the outline and dust had to be controlled within uh, 3,600 elevation feet, the, the old lake bed. So in the southern zone, we were going to try uh, managed vegetation and other flood control areas and remaining areas in green were delineated as well for dust control. So this was the beginning and eventually the whole 49 square miles of lake has been designated except for the brine pool, which is this area here. And the brine pool lies at elevation 3,554 give or take, depending on the rain year. And uh, that does not need to be controlled by dust. It's a uh, water, highly saline water with a, so I'm gonna focus from 2000 to 2007 on how we tackled the managed vegetation, dust control. Uh, that was my area working with a large team, as you can see here, the Department uh, Air Sciences, Inc. to measure the dust earthworks. That was my company. 
new fields, um, CH2M Hill, large engineering firm. I was sub two. Seed Dynamics, a seed priming company, SNS Seeds, uh, native seed growers, and uh, Sonora Pacific, a land management group, and also UC Davis for some of our research. And these are the site conditions we started with. I don't know if you used to drive up and down the 395 and look out. Sometimes you'd see this great white blob of 110 square miles of salt crust. That was the Owens Dry Lake. The electrical conductivity, the EC, which measures salinity, is 100 decisiemens per meter. So just to give you an idea, plants rarely can grow in soil over five unless they're salt tolerant. And even 100 is way past a salt tolerant plant. The sodium is much, much greater than calcium or magnesium ions. The pH is greater than 10. The soils, there are like 80 different soil types from cracking clays, that is, cracking meaning they are like a clay you would use to throw a pot with. And when they dry, they make big cracks. You can put your arm down them uh, to coarse, coarse sands, none of which is conducive to plant growth. And also, there was a shallow hypersaline groundwater. So everything, the salt grass, um, habitat that rings the lake in areas of natural springs, which is fresh water, rides on top of the saline groundwater. So this was our model, was the salt grass mainly. Uh, Disticula spicata, the species, it's a local species. It spreads by rhizomes. This is very important that it spreads on its own by rhizomes and it can spread up to two and a half meters without um, having to have a new plant particularly. So that's important to us as you'll see. And it tolerates salt and boron. It tolerates salt between 30 to 60 once established uh, decisiemens per meter. We had to have a very fast propagation strategy. As I mentioned, we had to have dust control within six years of the agreement that was signed. So in 2000, I had only two years to establish enough seeds to plant in 2002. That was the aggressive schedule. And I'll just say this about saltgrass. There was a lot of it at Owens Lake, but half of it were male. Here are the male flowers in the left corner. And here are the female flowers. See how different they are. They're a, it's a dioecious plant. So some plants are male and some plants are female. And this is uh, how it grows. So in order to get enough seed for the project, which had been um, assessed to be 2,200 acres, I had to work fast. And that's where all the seed companies and seed priming people came into play. So we had to collect enough seed, first of all, just to start the seed farms. And we had to collect female rhizomes to make sure we had enough females in the seed farms to set seed. We also had to enlist specialty 
seed primers from the Salinas Valley where they have, you know, very expensive different flowers and vegetables that all have to be primed so they germinate immediately at the same time. We had to do this as well because in natural conditions, whoops, I have to go back. Under natural conditions, saltgrass is a, not a high germinator. It's only 13 to 20 percent, and in a greenhouse, the same. The natural conditions require a fluctuation of 20 degrees between day and night. I had to develop a, pro a process that ensured a minimum of 75% germination in order to make it feasible to grow in the greenhouse. So this is an example. You see here unprimed seed and primed seed. So we got our seed primed, imbibed, imbibing water and salt and dried down until planting. So we could store the seed briefly and then plant it. I could only use one seed per small plug. In the research period, they were using five or six seeds for each plug, and that's how they would get enough plants to conduct their research. But we didn't have the time the space nor the money. This is one of 11 greenhouses we had filled with the seed once we had collected enough. And this is the layout of the farm, we call it, the managed vegetation farm. Uh, it's laid out in each of these squares is 40 acres. A 40 acre block was managed for irrigation. So that was important when it came time for planting. We had to get at least one 40 acre block done in order to be able to irrigate it. And we had to irrigate it immediately because <clears throat> it um, didn't work out the way I wanted it in terms of timing. Nothing ever does. And I was ended up planting in the middle of the summer. So here is, uh, the surface drip research areas that the Great Basin Air Pollution Control Program was conducting. We, um, we saw that this was problematic in the Owens Valley. The drip system on the surface moves around too much. So we went with a buried drip system and here's the test plot. We were running test plots almost as we were planting, we were getting the data like, okay, this will work. Kind of didn't know if it would before, but that's, um, that's how I, I used to tell myself before I would go to sleep at night, I didn't make the schedule. And that was the only way I could um, sleep. We had to come up with a bed spacing to meet cover compliance, but also that was reasonable in terms of the buried drip system and the cost and the number of plants we had. So here is the buried drip system. Here's the tube in the center. This is the reclaimed zone because we had to reclaim that hypersaline soil. And here's the little plug at the top. And that water could reclaim this area. And uh, it was the beds that we were planting on top of were about five feet. So that's about how far a rhizome can move so the plants could meet in the center of the fields of rows. So here we are planting at night with lights in July. Uh, it wasn't fun. And uh, the first night especially, we had 11 of these machines. And the uh, first night we got one going and finally the second one and it was touch and go. 
we were out there from five o'clock in the evening until eight o'clock in the morning getting just that first 40 acres done. But we got our feet under us and uh, went ahead and completed the planting in 2002. Here we are in the early spring. Uh, saltgrass goes dormant in the winter and the uh, salt crusts form on the lake again. Uh, so here we are with a tractor and a three ring roller rolling over the crust so that the poor little salt grass could emerge and start growing. And here we were by spring of 2003, so a year and a half growing season. Uh, so we were pretty pleased with the results. You see some areas that look a little bare. Those are areas we had to do some remedial work and we did. We did irrigation monitoring and adjustments. We did soil monitoring, plant cover monitoring, and uh, remedial management, which included some drainage, but it also included, um, included just abandoning some areas. For instance, this is a problem area, soil pit. <laughs> There's no way this will ever grow. This is called soil dispersion, and it occurs in very salty soils when you put fresh water on the soil. Now, we were not putting fresh water on the soil because we knew this could happen. This is an artifact of water from the Coso Mountains running onto the lake. So this is just in the middle of our plots and we had to uh, deal with it by ignoring it. This is our uh, vegetation monitoring um, irrigation checkpoints. So the blue are for areas that ponded water and the red are for dry and the uh, sort of chartreuse are for dry wet. A uh, couple of years spent walking out there every summer and what we concluded was that salt grass actually, even though it's a C4 grass and should be able to tolerate very high temperatures and continue to grow, has a thermal um, limit and it simply doesn't use water, no matter how much water you give it, in the middle of the summer. It took us a long time to convince the um, farm managers of this point. They wanted to just give it more water. And we kept saying, well, no, you're going to kill it. So we did an experiment with UC Davis called the drip irrigation reduction experiments or the dire plots. And it was dire for us to convince the managers to stop irrigating so much because there was a thought that the most of the water should be applied in the hottest part of the summer and we were telling them just the opposite. So finally by looking at these treatments I could show them that you can't kill salt grass by not irrigating once it's established, but you can kill it by too much water on these hypersaline soils. And they kept saying, but we see it standing in water all over the edge of the lake. I said, well, that's fresh water and the soil's completely different. And so finally, they agreed with me. And we got a reduction, summer reduction of irrigation. In fact, we just turn it off. Here, I was standing in the middle of the managed veg in early spring before the grass woke up in 2004. We were doing some remedial planting, but there was a big dust storm coming. So we had everyone off the lake. I was the last one out there and I decided 
against all the rules, but I had my dust mask on. I thought I would stand out there and just see how well the salt grass was doing. And so these are my pictures standing in one place, taking pictures all around me. I couldn't see the Sierras, I couldn't see the Cosos, and I couldn't see the Inyo Mountains that normally I can see. So I was surrounded and I could have probably laid into this wind and been supported by it. It was so windy, but there's no dust on the farm. And so this was key. We finally convinced a few, it took a few years of tests um, by air sciences to convince Great Basin Pollution Control District that indeed we had controlled the dust without the required 50% cover of every acre. And so we came up with an alternative requirement and that um, allowed us to save a lot of water. So you can see that of the backum, gravel uses no water, but it's quite expensive and hard to permit. No one wants gravel out there. It's not good for much. Shallow flood is less expensive than managed vegetation by uh, a couple of uh, ten, a couple of million an acre. Um, but it uses three to five acre feet of water a year. So there's the problem. Managed vegetation is more expensive because not only do you have the drip system, but you have to drain water in these um, drainage management units and they're expensive and they take maintenance. Um, but it only uses between 0.8 and 1.5 acre feet a year. So bingo. <laughs> but I remember we had all those different soil types. So not every soil is going to support salt grass. Some would have to be shallow flooded and actually some would have to be gravel. So that was our next adventure. But meanwhile, I had another task while we were getting the farm to grow and convince uh, Great Basin Air Pollution Control Board that we had indeed controlled dust. Um, there was a a requirement for wetland mitigation due to a few areas around the lake. So there was a 48 acre mitigation that had to be installed. Um, so myself and Amy Hiss from CH2M Hill uh, looked at sites all around the lake and even off the lake. Uh, we did a decision analysis for five sites and uh, found the best site, which was in the northeast area of the lake that was currently being shallow flooded. And uh, we got agency agreement. We did a test plot to show that we could do seeding rather than planting. And at first, everyone said, well, that's not going to work. And I said, well, why do you think it won't work? Plants all the time reproduce by seeds. So it was my, uh, my thing anyway. Most of my projects are mainly by seed. And Amy was, um, you know, managing the portion of the project, was willing to do tests. And uh, we found, yes, indeed, seeding will work with the uh, shallow flood mechanism for irrigation, which was a kind of flood irrigation. We had a list of about 13 species. 
found all on the lake that we collected. Um, we did a drill seeding. You see how flat this is? Nobody has to really level it too much. Um, here's here are the drill seeding rows after and now being um, flood irrigated. Prior to the drill seeding, we had to do some um, a, a season of reclamation. In other words, put water out there and have it drain away and put some more water out and keep trying to get the salts down because it was even though a good site, it still was very salty and had some areas of high boron. Um, but in any case, we got germination and uh, most of the species came up in that first year. This is what we expected was a kind of wetness mosaic, so ponding and some dry areas and then the vegetation growing in this darker gray area. And that's exactly what happened. Here we are monitoring. Um, and here is uh, the seed coming up in that first year. And the seed continued. So here is seed that came up in the first year. And then this area had no seed. But as we kept irrigating by the third year, reclamation was enough in this area and the seed still in its rows that we planted it came up. So with that, I was able to demonstrate that seeding could work and it would be far cheaper than installing the manage vegetation that we had on the farm. So here we thought, okay, we have a potential modified managed vegetation dust control. So nothing is easy on Owens Lake. That doesn't mean you can go out and have it. That means you have to go and suggest testing for a new backum or best available control measure. It has to be deemed so, and it has to be deemed so through tests that it works. But we had 40 acres in the ground, and uh, that was a pretty good start. And then about this time, word got out. Oh, <laughs> DWP is going to go and put a lot of vegetation on on Owens Lake. This is the relationship of adult western snowy plovers and shallow flood dust control. So you see here in the 1978, for some reason we had a very high number. Um, I can't tell you why. Uh, but I guess I trust the number, there it is. But generally, this is the number of snowy plovers from 1988 through 2000. And as the shallow flood started to be implemented, you start to see a sharp rise in adult western snowy plovers on the lake. And this continued and all the bird enthusiasts, including the um, Eastern Sierra Audubon, the California Audubon, uh, were not thrilled with the idea of converting shallow flood to vegetation. The planning committee was um, made up of agricultural, business, tribal governments, federal government, state government, including state lands that 
owns most of the Owens Lake. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, local governments, the Inyo County, um, environmental NGOs that I mentioned before, including uh, also the Native Plant Society, open space um, NGOs, energy uh, interests, including LADWP, as well as community and education groups. So it was very broad and everyone came together. And so you had the Owens Lake master planning process beginning. Dust control, which was mandated by the state implementation plan. You had habitat that was the interest of some of the NGOs. You had other public trust resources that are the interests of the state lands. Along with habitat, you have aesthetics, public access, and cultural resources. DWP was interested not only in controlling the dust, but also <laughs> they didn't want to use that much water. So their interest is in a reduction of water. And the Great Basin Air Pollution Control Program simply wants to control the dust. If they could, they would flood that whole lake. But this is the group and these are the processes and the interests that came together. The Grazers were mostly on the edges and not so much in the project area, as well as the Rio Tinto mine, also not exactly in the dust control area, but an interested party in attending with good input from them as well. So when I think about Biona, I think, what happened? You know, there was a public process but I think it was much more of a top-down process and the public just listened. Um, I could be wrong, but we can talk about that in the questions um, because you all were there more than I was because I was in Owens Lake. Um, so here's how Owens Lake did it. The, there was a facilitator an important factor, a non-interested, non-biased facilitator. So working together, the facilitator and participants will work together to create a problem-solving environment and to implement these agreements to that aim. And this is what the group agreed to in terms of how we would conduct ourselves in the meetings you know, listen and openly discuss the issues with others holding diverse views. View disagreements as problems to be solved rather than battles to be won. Refrain from ascribing motives or intentions to other participants. I think, you know, these first three are just like, okay, that's what we need to do. Respect the integrity and values of other participants. And then we get into the nuts and bolts of honor, time, don't waste people's time, don't talk forever, um, use conversational courtesy, appreciate humor, but don't engage in humor at the expense of others, and, uh, and keep your cell phone silent. This was the working nuts and bolts. There's other aspects to this planning process. There was a charter, there were agreements on if you don't agree, if there's not 100% consensus, what do we do then? And it goes through a whole process. Work groups were part of that process. So the entire almost 40 member stakeholder group couldn't know everything about all the aspects of Owens Lake. So work groups were formed as necessary during the process of the master planning. So there was a habitat work group and they were responsible for developing uh, 
you know, methods to support and, and uh, preserve habitat. And at first, um, you know, they were thinking of a preserve, like designate an area as a preserve. But what we finally, after several years, came up with a habitat suitability model across the whole lake. So it's a whole landscape scale model that guides uh, management of each of the dust control areas. And then others um, provide advice on implementation, uh, enhance strategies, and develop an adaptive management strategy. The dust control work group had to work mostly this was Great Basin and uh, state lands and the uh, air, air sciences and LADWP working on new and modified best available control methods. So this was timing and amount of each new or modified BACM, how you test the BACMs, timing of testing, et cetera, and how testing is perceived in terms of designated areas. Because remember, while we're in this planning group and, and as we're implementing dust control, the Great Basin Air Quality Pollution Control Board is, is designating new areas every few years. So it's not a static, well, we'll wait for 15 years and then we'll start. No, we're working, we're moving and doing. And there was also a public access and recreation group and uh, that was charged with developing how and where to um, incorporate public access. And all of these included cultural resources because you can't really move out there. You have to have monitoring and you have to work with the tribes on where the sensitive areas are. But especially in public access. So, Here's a uh, birders out on a big day, counting birds and uh, working, everyone working together. Here's designated dust control units. Uh, we had, much as the larger planning committee, we had uh, selected a person to run our meetings. And this person was with um, the Eastern Sierra Audubon, um, a retired um, lawyer. He is very good at running meetings, at summing up, at keeping everything on an even keel. So our small work group was run similarly to the larger planning committee. Um, I was part of it in that I was a scientist. I was still working for DWP, but we all trusted each other in, in these groups. And, um, you know, at first it's, it's odd. You think, well, who's the public? <laughs> you kind of have a chip on your shoulder because you've been working out there uh, just with your team and you think now I have to add this. It's already hard enough working on Owens Lake. But it really was so instructive and so such a good process. Um, and you had to be prepared. You had to be prepared for the planning committee meetings. Uh, you had to read everything they sent and you also had to be prepared for our habitat work group meetings. So this is an example of once we decided not to designate one area, and one of the reasons we decided not to designate just one area as a preserve is that when dust control first started in 2000 in the mitigation, they had said this will be 2000 acres will be designated for, for birds. And uh, okay, that was designated for birds and would be managed for birds, but guess what? The birds didn't like it. 
So then what? So we took the whole lake and applied uh, a habitat suitability model. And what that is, is you get parameters. In this case, I'm showing you the Owens Lake Meadow Guild. So guild members are, excuse me, tule elk, Owens Valley vole, other rodents and various reptiles, northern harrier, savannah sparrow, burrowing owl, and other ground nesting birds, as well as rare plants in wet to drier meadows. So you get a full um, range of species here and wildlife that you have to consider. So the parameters are vegetation cover, species diversity of the vegetation, the structure, was it, did it have some tall, some short, and then the vegetated topographic diversity. And this, you evaluate each of these parameters based on a zero to one, and you give it a score. And so each of these uh, dust control areas were given a score. The darker green is a higher score than the lighter green. So some have no score whatsoever because they're beyond the beyond for plants. Plants don't want to be in there at all. So this is what a lake wide and we also measured right up to the planning uh, area was to the old lake edge at 3600. Uh, elevation. And so it includes the existing seeps and springs along the edge of the lake. So not only the dust control areas, but the existing, so that they could be monitored and preserved. So <clears throat> the planning committee continued on until 2013. And at that time, they agreed on project objectives and planning framework. But there was a sticking point, and it's still being uh, worked out at this point. And so it became the master project. And so we wrote up, and I was one of the people that, for some reason, had to write up the collaboration report with my writing partner, Andrea Schmid. Um, so we, we took what was all agreed upon and put it into this report on Owens Lake. And in 2015, there was a CEQA notice for preparation of the master project based mostly on the frameworks developed here. Um, I'm just showing you this as a background. So here we are in 2010, starting on the master planning and the habitat work group is in the sort of magenta color here. Uh, we started in 2014 to work at the request of another work group, the groundwater work group. Uh, they wanted to know how much water, how much water could a seep or spring uh, get away with not having if DWP was going to pump groundwater. And so we had to develop this. Uh, we didn't know the answer, so we had to take several years to figure out how we would even approach that question and we came up with some great tools and a, a great resource protection plan that now they've taken into the groundwater work group. So that's how things can work together. Uh, different work groups can utilize technology, have speakers come in from the other work groups. So I'm just showing you the amount of time these things take. Uh, a long time. We in the Habitat Work Group uh, developed an adaptive management f 
for our habitat suitability model. So we identified the management priorities for each of the six guilds of, of uh, birds and animals. We then developed the management strategies and actions, as you saw in the habitat suitability model. We implement and monitor. So each criteria or parameter that is described for each guild is some parameter that can be measured either monthly or quarterly, seasonally, annually. It can be measured. This is the point. It can be measured and it can be measured without um, and really without great, I mean, there's effort in it, but it's not an irresponsible amount of measurement. So that was where you could say, well, this is a proxy. Um, we can't measure brine flies, for instance, that are very important to shorebirds. That's very time consuming and difficult to do, but we can measure salinity all the time. And that tells us if we have good brine fly habitat or not. So those are the types of proxies we can use for um, different aspects and make it measurable and make it doable. And then the reports can come annually and can be adjusted depending on the effectiveness monitoring. So the validation of the model and the annual effect effectiveness monitoring is coming from, you know, counting, for instance, birds, which is done frequently. And here we have some stilts, black neck stilts. So what came out of the Habitat Work Group uh, and the planning committee was the planning framework. So we ended up with five focal species um, of guilds. Breeding waterfowl, that's mallards and ducks, gadwalls. Migrating waterfowl, that's northern shovelers. Snowy, Western snowy plover has its own guild. Now it's a shorebird and it breeds there. And so do the avocets, but we created the first, we call it 1.0, habitat suitability model. And we had outside scientists review it. Then we made adjustments. We had, based on their recommendations, we had habitat suitability model 2.0. And a few years later, we sent it off to Point Blue, formerly Point Reyes, Bird Observatory, and Point Blue uh, went through the model with a fine tooth comb. And so we made the adjustments, worked with them back and forth, the whole habitat working group, and came up with 3.0. And we're getting ready, I think, uh, for a 3.1, perhaps. And that would be. Uh, based more on bird counts um, and small adjustments because remember none of these none of these focal guilds have been weighted they're all this equally important at this point but there could be a case made for snowy plovers being weighted because of their um, designation by the state um, so that's sort of where we are. Um, we're years into the monitoring and adaptive management and the adjustments. And here's the latest adjustment of 3.0, making the snowy plover habitat suitability model just its own guild and avocets went into uh, 
the migrating. So, you know, this is not just based on our own, but independent scientific review and uh, point blue being quite respected. The planning framework continues for water conservation and uh, you know, trying to get modified or transition water intensive dust control measures uh, to use less water. So they have something called a TWB2, which is um, a tillage <laughs> where you till the soil in great blocks. So it can only be in the clay soils. You till it and it, you leave it rough like that. And then it doesn't blow and it doesn't form the salt crust. But because uh, Great Basin Air Pollution District wants some backup, there is tillage with backum backup. So that's shallow flood. So if it starts to blow, you can immediately shallow flood the tillage area. I told you nothing was easy out here. <laughs> and all of these changes would then um, have to be evaluated within the habitat suitability model because we've committed to maintaining the value across the lake for each of the yields. And that means uh, we have to make something better somewhere else if we're going to take water away. So that's the balance. Um, right now we have three technical work groups going. Uh, the habitat work group, the groundwater work group, which we are supplying information to. And then uh, I think public access and recreation is still uh, operating. Although they, here is the public access points for the 110 square miles. Uh, I just put this up here because even at Owens Lake, as big as it is, nobody wants the public running amok amongst the birds habitat or the meadow voles habitat. So here it is, the main highway through all the dust control and you can enter on sulfate road, you can enter at Dirty Sock Springs or at Willow Dip Lake Minerals Road and you can drive through and out and here's uh, Brady Highway up at the north end of the lake. And there are some areas here about this area where you can get a good view. There's a good uh, overlook, um, nice public trail through there. So why did I tell you all this? Well, because it occurred to me that Biona, is there the will for a collaborative approach among CDFW, state lands, LA County, all the nonprofits, and the private businesses? Is there that will? I don't know. So, are there any questions? Cindy seems to have one. Okay, so Cindy, go ahead. Are there people who are professional facilitators? Oh, yes. Uh, we had a, a group out of uh, Sacramento State University. Uh, there's a different facilitator after all these years, but um, yes, there are people. We, you know, at the beginning of of the process, they interviewed several different people mm -hmm. before they decided who. And I believe that was, you know, probably uh, California Audubon with LADWP executive committee. There was an executive committee. So, Walter? <laughs>
So going, I agree that a facilitator is perhaps the biggest uh, or most important element of these discussions because it is my experience that there is so much animosity, just personal animosity built up that it is really hard to ask even just a scientific question without somebody feeling as though they're being attacked. And if you, you know, we, we oftentimes divide up into groups and have conversations, this group, that group, and we're not speaking together at the same time so that we can address one group's perceptions, you know, with scientific information. And just, to, I'll make just one quick example. You know, Jonathan, who I'm not sure is on the call, um, found, you know, Lee Bell's Verios, and we, he and I text back all the time now about the least Bell's Verios, which were confirmed to be nesting in the Bayona wetlands. And this has become, this is something that should just be a scientific observation. And somehow it's been politicized where some folks want to downplay um, the presence of the Verios and other people want to sort of play it up. And rather than just incorporating the scientific information, having an objective conversation about it, so I think a facilitator who truly was impartial, and that's key because we've had some facilitators who have not been impartial, um, but they can kind of pull everyone back from the brink and, and, and refocus. And I think the key thing on your slide, Margo, which I did see from a Biona Wetlands work group slide from 2008, is this idea of um, treating disagreements as challenges to be addressed rather than, or problems to be solved rather than battles to be won. Yes. And, and it was interesting to me to see that in a Biona work group presentation back in 2008, when there used to be actually quite a few groups and they've all been, I think the last of them met in 2012. And I guess, sorry to take such a long time to wrap this into a question for you, Margo, but what are your thoughts on all these groups having ended in 2012, um, you know, when they completed the feasibility study, do you think that those groups could come back and have a role now, given kind of that we're stuck? It seems like we're stuck in part of the planning process. Well, I think it's kind of the only way if we're going to avoid this acrimony continuing is to bring it back let's listen I, I, you know owens was pretty acrimonious before we got started on the on this uh planning master plan i mean no one trusted ladwp uh, <laughs> I can just tell you. And, you know, as a scientist working on the project, you kind of think, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to answer, you know, questions. But everyone's interested and everyone's honestly interested. And so there were no, uh, once the ground rules were laid out, there was very little disingenuous behavior. Um, you know, people just said what they needed to say. Uh, so I think given that Owens was acrimonious before, so acrimonious that, you know, the Nature Conservancy, California Audubon, Eastern Sierra Audubon, and the Plant Society, Native Plant Society, were all working on a management plan without the very persons they needed to implement it. You know, I don't know how they thought that was gonna work to present something to DWP without DWP being engaged in the process. But that's where it was. So it kind of similar 
So if that could work up in Owens, where it's, it's, it's beyond Biona, it's their livelihood, you know, it's their community, really. I mean, it's our community in a way, but we have a bigger community. That's what they have is the Owens Valley and, you know, they don't view LADWP in the best light. So it was, uh, I think if Leslie's asked it a question, who funded the facilitator? Let me unshare, here, here I go. Well, DWP of course had the and the whole thing that was uh that was the deal they uh funded the facilitator they paid for the agencies they paid uh some of the scientists other scientists were working for great basin air pollution i think they have their own money but you know compared to dust control i think it was a drop in the bucket oh, patricia has a question here patricia says owens is amazing looking looking so and so terrific biona was supposed to base be based on similar process right it's right. to top down but now the question is can we get it back to the original concept that is the question but we will never know the answer if we don't ask that question well and that's what i'm you know certainly showing this and the fact that this truly does work and how amazing Owens Lake, I mean, I gotta go out there <laughs> since I've seen it the way it was before. Um, because this whole story and how you've gone about the process, I think we are, um, you know, you're the model for what we were supposed to have and, and you showed it works. So if we can just get back there. Yeah. I mean, it just occurred to me, when was that, a year, year and a half ago at the Coastal Commission meeting? I just blurted it out. I said, you know, oh, yes. people, people think that it couldn't work, but it did work in a, in a really, you know, acrimonious place. So, um, But also, your, as you developed it and went on, your habitat sustainability or suitability modeling as you went into area by area is more like Joy Zedler when they found that everything went wrong in San Diego when they bulldozed and they went to an inch by inch approach to keep you know, everything intact as much as possible. You know, and especially from a soil standpoint, they totally screwed up the soils. Right. And, 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 um, but I, I, this, this is a terrific presentation and I think it's very important for all those coastal commissioners and other agency entities to, to see this and see that it does work and, and bravo, bravo. Well, to all the people, I mean, <laughs> I was a consultant, so think of all the people. Now you gotta consider this, that was, year after year, month after month, uh, meetings. Wow, there were a lot of meetings. Sometimes I would drive up, you know, take in a meeting and drive back in the same day. And it was just like <laughs> blurry, but it was so many meetings. Uh, so the people who aren't getting paid to do that, all of you and me now, uh, you really have to commit because that's one of the things that's key. That, that each NGO chooses the person that's going to represent. And that person has to commit to be the one to go. Because that way, you have continuity. Yeah. And then there's built in where you can take anything that's now something to be decided by an organization, you take it back to your organization and there's time for all that. Mm -hmm. And no one speaks, the facilitator never speaks to the press. Um, you get talking points, so we're all cohesive. No wild hairs. 
we're working and we're all respecting and that's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. Margot Walter has a question. Um, I think Kathy had her hand up. Kathy, do you have your, you, you had a question? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, um, Marco, like here at the Biona Wetlands, we have these two private corporations, Playa Vista and SoCal Gas. Yep. And do you think that's going to have any particular, you know, problem compared to the, um, to, to, the, the, to the Rio Tinto mine and the grazers? It's a little different. Um, but we have to try even with them. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be, I think, a bit harder, but maybe you look at SoCal Gas more like BWP. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well. But we have to go in, you know, they have to, um, I suppose they could not join the collaborative, but Oh, that would be foolish. Okay. On, on their so you think part. they should be part of it? Okay. Yeah, I think okay. everyone has to be a part of it to make it work. Because otherwise, you know, they could have, you know, political connections we don't have. But if they're part of the whole thing, then everyone's neutralized in that way, I think, and we're more honest. Um, yeah, Walter. DWP funded it, but uh, the facilitator, but there was a committee to interview them made up of representatives. Not every group felt they needed to interview. Thanks. Margo, uh, Jim Kennedy has a question. Hi, yeah. Margo. Uh, I, I wrote out my question. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I see it. Yes, thank you. Oh, why was restoring Owens Lake to its historic water level not an option? Um, do, you, do you like to uh, have water, Jim? That's not the point. <laughs> that's, that's certainly the point. It was not an option because there's not enough water. So, so what, what would, would happen what would happen if a group, if a group did no so to any dust control and would accept only historic accurate and wanted all the water back. Well, you know, the tribes were there and that's not exactly what they asked for. If that had happened, I mean, it's a hypothetical. There's a, a whole consensus uh, approach. So we didn't need a hundred percent for consensus, but there would be a process to work, subcommittee formed to work through the disagreements. And if that didn't work, then it could go to the um, the governmental entities. Um, I forget what we called that, like an executive, above the executive committee. Okay, Margo, uh, wasn't. Leslie has a question. Leslie's question is, was it difficult to get people to agree and work together? Well, it was a little sticky at first, but um, because the facilitator was good, she had a way of working and uh and if you had a problem with how things were going you could talk to her uh was a woman you could talk to her um confidentially and then she took that under advisement and uh but it seemed to go fairly well there would be some hiccups where we would get a surprise from a group and have to work through it. Mainly, uh, well, I don't know. I can't remember all of them, but uh, yeah. Ben, you want to ask that question? Well, yeah, I, I see it. Uh, I'm, can you, am I unmuted now? 
You're unmuted. Oh, good. Um, is it possible for the meetings uh, to be monitored properly when you're meeting remotely like we are right now today? Okay, I thought about that. I thought about that when I was putting this together. I wouldn't recommend it. Sometimes, sometimes some members had to come on remotely, but not very often. And I'll tell you, it works better to meet in person, I think. I, I, well, I agree, absolutely. But we're in a situation now where if we're, and by the way, I want to congratulate you on a, a phenomenal job. It's this seeing what you were able to accomplish in a short period of time is like reading a science fiction book, but you actually did it. So <laughs> well, <laughs> you you turned you, you you really have given me a boost of hope here. <laughs> well, and, uh, it was a big team. A big smile. <laughs> it, was, it was a big team. Um, you know, uh, unlimited money. Let's let's uh, you know. It wasn't like. There was a, it was, if you're a lifelong learner and you love to learn, this was an amazing project. <laughs> well, it, it, it is, you were, it's a transformational experience for the people, but as well as, as for a part of the planet and a fairly large and yes. influential part of the planet. And you helped turn that around. You know, it's uh, been designated by the North, is it the North American uh, bird something uh, as an important area? So not just Audubon, but like hemispherically it's become. Uh, but our future right right now, you know, with this group, our, our interest is there at uh, Biona Wetlands. Yep. And having, having you uh, and your experience working with the arbitrator and somebody running the group who is uh, disinterested, we really need that because we need to manage for an, uh, integrity so that the, the group and each individual uh, develops a, um, power to put forth positive solution. Uh, without, without integrity and without uh, uh, transparency, that, I don't see that uh, happening. Um, this group, though, operated primarily secretly. No press release and no contact. Uh, to the outside? Um, no, it wasn't secret. You could you could talk with your group and you could issue talking points, but uh -huh. they didn't want people talking on their own opinion because it was the planning committee. Right. So did you have any capacity? Did you ever do press releases from the planning committee? Yes, I believe they did okay. frequently. Uh, thank you. I don't want to take over the meeting here. I, I, I just want to compliment you. All of your presentations are so marvelous. What, what a, I wish my career had been working with you rather than what I did, but <laughs> so it is. Ben, thanks. We have Jim Kennedy who has a question and then one more after that, and then we're going to have to pull this all to a close. So, uh, so Jim, go ahead. That I really appreciate listening to the process that you went through with the different uh, groups and their decision making process. But if I understand your presentation correctly, they had a limited number of choices of uh, raking, shallow flooding, uh, managed vegetation, maybe one or two other ones. Uh, so to me, that's it's kind of a top down decision making already by limiting that because. DWP was going to have to do something within the time frame that the court order mandate told yeah. them they had to do. And so they brought in the community to kind of hopefully build a consensus amongst a few choices. Is that correct? No. no. Okay. There were just those three choices, the gravel, the shallow flood, and, and the managed vegetation. That was coming from the Great Basin Air Pollution control board. Okay. Those were the choices that were approved, tested by Great Basin, and you can't use anything until it's tested. And you have to get a lease from state lands to even be able to test. So yes, 
these were the three, but, and DWP was very interested in, you know, using less water because they need water, they're a water agency. That's why they took the water in the first place. So the idea was they were gonna go to more water savings. And one of the, one of the uh, main emphasis from DWP's point in this collaboration that started in 2010, so they started controlling dust in 2000 with those three, and they were already thinking about other types of uh, modifications and testing those. So how the dust was gonna be controlled was one issue, but how the other interested parties were going to maintain the other values at the lake. That's what the collaboration was about. DWP, yeah, was gonna, you know, do the dust control based on what Great Basin said they could do. On, you know, Great Basin uh, makes the testing protocols. And LADWP has to go through those hoops. So it was, how DWP was gonna go through those hoops and maintain these other values, which are all public trust values, habitat, public access, uh, aesthetics, cultural resources, all those things. So that was the collaboration. And how were they going, what were they gonna do with the water? So the big sticking point is right now, the water the groundwater. Um, and that's what uh, DWP is doing a very long study on groundwater feasibility. And so that remains to be seen. But uh, it's top down in the sense of Great Basin Air Pollution District is gonna say, eh, we don't like, we don't like, uh, this method. We don't think, okay, here's what it has to do if it's going to get approved. And then state lands has to agree. So that was another aspect of this from all the agencies' points of view, from state lands and fish and wildlife, state fish and wildlife, and DWP. Every time DWP moves, they had to have another lease from state lands. And every time they had to have another permit from Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's just cumbersome on the same project, just was very cumbersome. So part of the planning master plan process was to streamline that process. So that's still a goal. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Margot, let me just ask a question in terms of the participants. Did you say there was an in, uh, indigenous people uh, involved in this uh, whole process? Yes. The, like, there were and, two tribes involved, the, the Paiute uh, Bishop and the Paiute Shoshone. Okay. Uh, we've been reading this, uh, this braiding sweet grass, Robin Wall Kimmerer. And I, I wanna read one paragraph and it's an indigenous approach to finding somebody to coordinate. Uh, and it may be useful. We give thanks to all of the waters of the world for quenching our thirst, for providing strength and nurturing life for all beings. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls, rain, mists, and streams, rivers and oceans, snow and ice. We are grateful that the waters are still here and meeting their responsibility to the rest of creation. Can we agree that water is important to our lives and bring our minds together as one 
to send greetings and thanks to the water. Now our minds are one. And uh, my feeling is there the common ground, uh, I, I'm almost uh, tempted to say the indigenous, if there's some indigenous uh, people uh, that are involved uh, in, in terms of the Biona wetlands, uh, I would certainly look to them as a source of guidance in terms of how to bring, uh, uh, bring some coordination. Uh, th this chapter is pretty powerful from what I've read. And uh, you went to Sacramento State to find a, a coordinator and you may, uh, I, I don't know, it's just a suggestion that there may be some uh, more local indigenous uh, guides to uh, how to transform this over to the Biona wetlands. Uh, just a suggestion. Well, as uh, Patricia is indicating, it's a site is a registered sacred site. Yeah. And uh, John Tommy Rosa was uh, involved in this uh, process. So, Margo. Hmm. Great, great job tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your experience and all the lessons you learned with us. Uh, it really is uh, inspiring. Your work is inspiring. What you've learned is inspiring. And uh, I hope that we're able to implement that into the issues that we have here with the various stakeholders that are involved here. And it sounds like that that you had a very similar experience. So we're looking for your guidance <laughs> and taking your lead. <laughs> oh, I'll try. <laughs> okay. So thank you everyone for showing up and stopping by. It's been a real pleasure and we'll be having another meeting next month. Hope you'll show up again. We'll let you know what that's gonna be. And until that time, be safe, stay sane and take care of your loved ones. So Thank you, Margo. We'll be closing this meeting. Uh, have a good night.